What is up, plant people? It's time once more for the Planthropology Podcast, the show where we dive into the lives and careers of some very cool plant people to figure out why they do what they do and what keeps them coming back for more. I'm Vikram Baliga, your host and your humble guide in this journey through the sciences. And as always, my friends, I am so excited to be with you today. And I'm especially excited for this episode because it's one that we recorded a couple of months ago and I've been not sitting on, that's not right, but I've had a whole bunch of other stuff going on, a bunch of different episodes coming out. But I so much enjoyed this one, and it's kind of fun getting to go back after a couple of months as I'm editing and hear the conversation again because my guest for today, Dr. Sarah Dugnan, is just the coolest. Just the coolest. So Sarah is the host of the Anthro Dish podcast and all the other things, the writing that goes with it, and uh, she has a sub stack and all kinds of other things. But she has a background in everything from medical anthropology to archaeology to water and food and everything else, everything else. She knows so much and has done so much in the food and food anthropology space and food as a cultural thing and food is a health thing and all the things that really itch that part of my brain that wants to know about how we interact with food and how we interact with plants and the world around us. And it was just such a fun conversation. Sarah is delightful and just a wealth of knowledge and so smart and so fun. And and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. I know that I enjoyed it when I got to talk to her and I enjoyed it again, all over again as I edited it and it's just great. So if you're interested in how we culturally approach food and how food interacts with our day-to-day lives and our politics and our well-being and everything in between, this is the episode for you. So without any other delay, my dearest friends, here is episode 109 of the Planthropology Podcast, Food is Knowledge, Eating Equitably, and Digital Literacy with, with Dr. Sarah Dugnan of the Anthro Dish Podcast. Well, Sarah, I am so excited to get to talk to you today. Um, we've been kind of following each other and interacting on social media for a while. And, and like we were kind of chatting before the interview, it's exciting just to get to have this FaceTime a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Good. How's your day going so far? Uh, it's going all right. It's um, I'm up in Ontario, so it's very gray. It's kind of that wintry, kind of fall, spring, winter mood. So, yeah. I understand that for sure. Now, I it, I say I understand that. Now, I'm in Texas, and so to, <laughs> it was it was that way over the weekend, cold, dreary, rainy. And then today, I think it's supposed to be 70 Fahrenheit, which is, I don't, I can't do the math quick enough in my head, but it's warm That's nice. and sunny. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, again, thanks for agreeing to be on. I'm excited to get to, to chat about what you do in your podcast and about food and everything else. But uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more? Tell us where you're from, what you do, and, and how you got there. Sure. So uh, my name is Sarah Dugan. I am currently living in Guelph, Ontario. Um, I'm from Peterborough or Nagojuan, Ontario. Um, and I am a food podcaster, but I'm also a medical anthropologist, which um, I feel like when people hear medical anthro, they don't necessarily think about food, but to me, it's it's all related. Um, in terms of how I got to this point, um, I I think growing up in particularly in Ontario, in more small town communities, um, just being exposed to the natural world a lot more allowed for a really good connection between uh, myself and you know being outside being aware of like how many beautiful freshwater lakes we have, um, and all the natural world around that. So it, it just kind of was a part of me from, from a very early age. Um, and I'd also like to credit, you know, I went to a pretty hippie university for my undergrad. (laughs) (laughs) So that definitely, so I went to Trent university, um, and it's very environmentally focused. It's very much looking at how can we create, you know, local, locally and sustainably sourced food pathways for people, um, even university students. So I think, you know, it was, it was always there. It was always kind of an underlying message. And then as I took the jump into grad school, um, and worked within 
uh, I went to University of Manitoba for my master's and then McMaster University for my PhD. Um, I'd started out in archaeology, so it was kind of a gradual <laughs> yeah. transition, which I don't often talk about. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so somehow I managed to move from archaeology into more community-based health within my PhD work. That's really fascinating. It, and, you know, at least in my mind, and, and maybe and you say that that maybe it doesn't track or that you don't talk about it much, but it makes some sense to me because I think food and the way that we eat and the way that we grow things and is, is so much a cultural center for Mm -hmm. throughout time. Right. And, you know, we look at, uh, early cultures and you, you obviously know more about this than I do, but, uh, and, and, and so much of it was like, what did they grow? How did they cook it? What did they eat? What's how, how did their society revolve around that? And that it makes sense that the more you learn about old cultures, that's such a pivotal part. Like it, it, for me, at least it tracks. I think that's such a cool progression too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It, it definitely tracks for me too. in that it's, you know, I think working, I'd worked a lot on like skeletal populations and, and excavations relating to that. Um, and in my master's, I was looking at like Danish populations moving through, um, the little ice age and the global warming period. And so I was looking at, you know, how did their diets change? How do they move during climate change and, you know, bubonic plague and things like that. And it was really understanding like, oh, food has a huge role in terms of the health outcomes. You can see that in the skeletal evidence. Um, And then it prompted a much, I don't know, a pretty natural transition for me of, well, how do we think about the world today in terms of how we eat? Um, How is our health informed both by our food and our water and our ability to source that or, you know, the political and social structures that uh, limit that as well? Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and, I'm trying to think how to how I want to phrase my my question. <laughs> uh, there is so much of you know you talked about the political structures that influence food and influence water especially. Um, you know you have a, a great paper you wrote. I guess I guess this was, this was on your PhD research, right? Looking mm-hmm. at um, water insecurity among uh, First Nations and um, different peoples. How did like? Again, I've I've worked in water for a lot of my career, and I've looked at the way yeah. that uh, people relate to water and how they see water as a resource and all of that. Could you talk a little bit more about some of the research you did and, and how you got into that specifically? Because I, I think that's a sort of a fascinating facet of food and, and society as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I agree, and I'm always happy to, to nerd out on water stuff. Um I think an important piece that I want to note is um, when I was growing up, I was in a school that had a lot of um, First Nations educators. And uh, I think it would have been about grade four, grade five. Um, You know, you start start learning about like Canadian history and you start learning about um, Indigenous and settler relationships. And it's very much within this bound textbook of particular expectations. And during that time, there was a... um, water crisis in Sheshawan First Nation, which is up in Northern Ontario. Um, So a lot of the teachers that I had at that point started pulling resources together and ended up um, helping with the evacuation of Sheshawan students and youth um, to Peterborough. So at the time, I'm like reading about these relationships that, you know, first settlers had with Indigenous people, and it's not lining up with how, you know, the reality was in, I can't remember (laughs) what year I was in grade four, but knowing that all these people didn't have access to water. Um, and we were living in Ontario and we kept being told this is, you know, this is, a a country of, of privileges and, um, affordances, and we all have this ability to access clean water. It just, you know, even at that young age, it very much didn't line up. So that really shaped how I thought about, um, relationships between settlers and, and indigenous peoples across Canada from a young age. So I feel lucky in that sense to, have had that awareness. And then in terms of the research itself, um, quite frankly, there was a um, Indigenous scholar in our department who had started this huge project um, and she and her team and reached, reached out to me. And I was really interested in looking at health, but um, I'd been going down a, a different avenue in my early PhD. And, and when she reached out, um, Dr. Don, Don Martin Hill, uh, it just, it felt like a no brainer. Like, yeah, of course I can use my skills to help out with this project um, and really kind of situate. It was interesting because it was very interdisciplinary. So there were lots of engineers and biologists um, and I don't know how frequently you've worked with them, but they can be a little less sensitive to kind of human behaviors. <laughs> to put it oh, nicely. Yeah, no, uh, I, absolutely. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> so it was a lot of translating between, okay, um, you know, getting acquainted with um, Six Nations, First Nation and and the people there and how can I work with them and kind of translate what they're experiencing to engineers and biologists and then vice versa. How can I bring the engineer and biologist research in a way that, you know, makes sense and is is useful for communities? So that's kind of the long-winded story of that. No, it's interesting. And, and again, we I, I like the story you tell a little bit about how, you know, think we chase we chase opportunities where they come up and we chase them where they are meaningful and edifying and, and all of those things. But sometimes it's like, here's a project. Do you want to work on it? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, sure. Yeah, I, I did my master's degree in olive production. I studied uh, uh, water use in olives in South Texas uh, near the Mexican border. And, um, I had going in zero interest in, in olives, like at, at all. I, my, my background is actually in, um, landscape design and, and water conservation and things like that. When I, when I applied to my master's program, I was like, yeah, I'm really interested in landscape. And they were like, well, we have funding for a, a project in olives. And I was like, great, let's, let's <laughs> learn about olives. <laughs> And uh, but some of those opportunities so much drive the way that our career goes and our academic like life goes that it's it's fun to have the opportunity sometimes to chase something a little bit different. Yeah, I agree. And I find sometimes, too, with particularly thinking through anthropological work, um, I feel a little uncomfortable in certain circumstances in terms of being that kind of helicopter researcher of just going into a community and being like, we know what's best for you. Um, so having the opportunity to work with someone who's from the community who offered that spot up, it just felt like a much more natural fit than trying to like squish myself into something that just didn't fit either. That's really, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to talk more about your podcast and some of your outreach stuff you do, um, maybe maybe towards the end of this interview or a little bit later in this interview. But I'm curious now, um, reading through, you know, some of your articles you write on on Substack and just some of the other work you do, it seems like you have found a really cool connection point between all of the different things, anthropology and environment and food and culture and all of this. And for me, it's such a cool like collaboration of all of these different fields. Um, and we've been kind of chatting about it a little bit, but can you give me your thoughts on, and I know this is not a small question, so I'm going to try <laughs> to keep it as uh, <laughs> maybe as con- con- digestible, consumable, whatever is possible. But where, how did, how did you come to this point where you're, you know, you've, you've studied water, you've studied anthropology, um, you know, obviously you're interested in the environment and the climate. Like how did you find sort of your niche? Because I think that sometimes mm-hmm. as people are trying to decide what to do with their lives, you know, and you know what they want to be when they grow up, which I'll let you know if I ever figure that out, <laughs> I still don't know. Uh, really like finding where they maybe belong professionally and academically is really hard. Um, and, and just, you know, hearing you talk on your podcast and reading your work, it feels like you've really found like that sweet spot for you. Like, how did you get there? Because I think that's a a great, yeah, again, easy, small questions. Um, but I think that's a good thing for people to hear. It's interesting that you ask that because that's something I, I still struggle with. I mean, mm. similar to what you're saying. <laughs> um, but I find it's one of those things where I've always had um, I've always had an interest in maintaining a kind of holistic approach to things. Um, you know, how can we how can we look at this in different angles? And you know, I don't I know I just have one perspective, and and that can come into you know a bigger conversation with different perspectives to make you know make more sustainable solutions or more nuanced solutions. Um, but I think in terms of where I came to with it, it was really a reflection of like life crashing into work. Um, Hmm. (laughs) so, um, you know, I was, I was going through my PhD, I was being a teaching assistant, but I was also, um, single parenting and I was working at a restaurant and, um, it just was kind of an unavoidable nexus of, of sitting through these classrooms and sitting through, um, you know, listening through undergraduate lectures that I'd heard time and time again, um, and not really feeling like voices were being represented in a way that was, um, comprehensive. Like it just felt like it was, again, just one particular narrator shaping 
shaping these perspectives on hmm. food. Um, and then I was looking at the restaurant industry in Toronto and this would be in the 2010s and thinking about all the different people that I knew there doing really creative, interesting work um, and struggling. And I think ultimately, you know, it just felt like there was a, such a huge disconnect and I was interested in looking at how can we kind of bridge those gaps a little bit more. Um, but in terms of, yeah, how it's kind of come into my food writing in place, I think it just comes from more conversations with people. Um, it has allowed me to kind of stop and reflect a bit more on how I see food. And uh, again, I think being in a position of serving in Toronto when you are like a broke grad student um, and you're <laughs> serving these like huge plates of food that <laughs> you can't actually afford, it just, it, it completely shapes your perspective. And um, for me, I, I always end up just asking more questions and and that kind of guides the writing and the the social media work that I did as well. That's really, really fascinating. Some of the work that I have done professionally, and maybe I'm getting into academically, I, I would spend a lot of time as like a community educator and, and things like that. And I've worked in that quite a bit. But a lot of that was in food and food supply. And we've done like community gardens and, and work in those kinds of things. Uh, you wrote an article, I, I think back in November on your Substack, talking about affordable and accessible food. And that's something that's really close to my heart. And um, I know that culturally and politically, there are some uh, quite a few differences between like where I am and where you are. <laughs> but but reading some of your work, it seems like, though, some of these core problems about access to food and, and food security um, are not so different. Maybe these are more universal problems just based on the way that our societies are built. Can you talk about that article and what like um, – kind of drove you to talking about like food access and all of those things? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, in terms of thinking about food access as a writing point, um, for me, it, it tends to be a constant frustration, especially, you know, post 2020 onward. Um, I've found the food system, like looking at our food system in real time has been a really fascinating exploration into you know, what led us to this point? Why are we at this point where, um, you know, within the context of, of Canadian food systems, um, and I'm sure you could speak to it um, in America and in Texas, but um, the food prices here are just skyrocketing to a point where people can't afford them. Food bank use is um, increasing and setting like record breaking highs. And we don't in Canada have any sort of like food support network um, or social support network for it. Um, we don't have school lunch programs. We don't have like nationally mandated um, food programs. And obviously there's there's <laughs> issues and limitations within those too, but um, there's no like social support or safety net um, for those sorts of things. And I think uh, just seeing it again, play out in real time, seeing, you know, the, <laughs> the grocery shop uh, budgets and in having to increase week by week. And um, there's been some really interesting uh, kind of elements with different Canadian CEOs of different grocery stores, um, <laughs> uh, getting involved in like food, uh, pricing scandals and things like that. So it sounds, it felt like a really good place to explore how all of our social, political, and cultural, um, structures, particularly in Canada right now are at this interesting juncture of, of being challenged and kind of hitting that point where, they're, they're fracturing based on, you know, all of these different things happening. Um, but I think too, ultimately, like, I like to look back at the idea of food access in, in the States and in Canada, um, as being intentional. I think a lot of the, um, again, a lot of the sort of legislature and policy around food is not necessarily reflective of like the realities that people face. And so when we see it starting to crumble and we see it not being sustainable for people to be able to access food, um, then you start to look at different policies and, and bills and like the history of that and how that's kind of shaped how we come to think about access to. Gosh. Yeah. And, and <laughs> that is, I mean, it's, it's such a big issue and it is, it is something certainly that we, we face here and, you know, maybe we have some systems in place. You'd mentioned school lunches and things like that. So we do, we do have some kind of social safety net in terms of food supply, but it's inadequate, uh, mm -hmm. it, overall, right? Like, uh, yes, it's, 
it helps, but it's almost like, I don't know, trying to uh, drink soup with a fork. You know, you, <laughs> you get a little bit, but you don't get it all. And, and that's something we certainly saw, um, you know, through shutdowns in 2020 and through, you know, we had in, in California and parts of Texas where um, labor became such a huge issue in terms of our food system um, because most of it's migrant labor and, and um, seasonal labor and those people couldn't come into the country. They couldn't get in the fields and there were hundreds of thousands of tons of food produce that rotted in the field because no one could harvest mm-hmm. it. And when that sort of starts hitting, I think we realize the fragility of our food system sometimes and how much we need that that safety net and and those regional and sort of more localized food systems and stuff like that. So it is it is such a big thing, but I think the more people who talk about it, the better, especially from an informed and sort of like knowledgeable standpoint. Yeah, I agree. And I think like, again, when, when I think about the idea of the food system kind of being intentionally structured this way, I think a lot about like industrial agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I want to like sick all the industrial agricultural people on us for having this conversation, but, um, you know, even thinking about the Canadian food guide itself is like a political text where Mm -hmm. it's been long informed by lobbyists. So, um, milk and dairy lobbyists, uh, meat lobbyists, and different um, like big egg companies have spent a lot of money lobbying so that um, particularly during the 1950s to 1990s, you would see more um, dairy, bread, juice, meats being recommended um, because there was money behind that. And mm-hmm. it was only in the 2020 restructure for the food guide where they actually had like nutritional scientists come in and say, Hey, this isn't exactly (laughs) the most like nourishing plate. So maybe let's bring some, some science to it and see what happens with that. Well, that's kind of a big deal, right? Yeah. (laughs) I think think having, having the, the scientific backing, you know, and I think about the old food pyramid that we, or I, at least, you know, I don't know if it's the same food pyramid, but similar rainbow. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Same idea of, uh, that we grew up with. Oh, this is what we should eat. And then you really dive into it. And it's like, well, mm, you know, so there are certainly some issues there. But what what has been encouraging for me, and I, I'd be curious to hear what you have seen um, sort of in your area is how many people are going back to and, and, and trying to start like grassroots community led operations to plug some of these gaps in the system. Like we have community gardens. We have our, our local food bank actually has a uh, farm. Uh, We have a a food bank farm and they have an apple orchard and they have uh, greenhouses and high tunnels. I think it's about seven acres of land. And then they have a CSA program Mm -hmm. and they donate to the food bank and, or, or run some of it through the food bank. It was really cool community led efforts that are trying to make sure people have food to eat. Are you seeing that where you are? Are there those types of efforts going into place? There definitely are. Um, There's been some really interesting conversations, again, really starting in 2020 onwards. Um, There's a lot of really great not-for-profits here that are community-driven. So uh, I'm forgetting the name of it now, Toronto Food... I'll, I'll have to send it to no, you. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are a few different food initiatives in Toronto. There's um, Sundance Harvest. There's also um, CSA farms across like Southern Ontario that that I know a little bit better than across Canada. Um, but then we also have a lot of like university researchers teaming up with um, with farmers and agricultural specialists. Um, Dr. Tamara Soma is someone who's doing that out in BC. It just fantastic job really looking at like food landscapes and food planning um, to create systems that are a bit less wasteful. Um, There's also people who are looking at, you know, reusing imperfect process or produce. Hmm. Um, So taking that from grocery stores who have, you know, the ones that have like blemishes on them or they're starting to look a little funky. Um, I'd argue (laughs) this day and age, like we have a lot of rotting produce, so I'm not sure (laughs) if those initiatives are, are as fast or as able these days, but there certainly are a lot of community initiatives. I think there's also a lot of barriers to accessing those. Sure. Um, so it's like an interesting connection, right? Like there's, I think Sundance Harvest is one of those places where they're offering youth the opportunity to learn how to farm yeah. and to um, to create community through food in an accessible way. Um, and I know through different First Nations reserves, there's, there's those movements as well. But 
Um, I think, you know, if you live in more urban spaces, that's still quite a challenge, especially for youth um, who might not necessarily know where to start or where to connect. Uh, that would be the biggest shift, like thinking Toronto specifically. But. Sure. No, that's, and that's really interesting. And I, I just ask because I, you know, I think we get so siloed sometimes in, in our areas and it's hard to see sort of the big global picture of, you know, I know U.S. and Canada, we're still over here in our little, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but still like, I think hearing more perspectives on how we as people try to take care of people, I, you know, there's, there's large programs and there's, there's government programs or not. And then there's, you know, social programs or not. But I think what has encouraged me and has given me so much hope through all this is those grassroots community efforts. I think that is just such a, a cool thing to hear about and, and learn about how it works different places. Um, so that's actually a, a good segue, I think. And we'll take a quick break. But when we come back, I want to talk about your podcast and how you got into that. Because, you know, uh, as I was started listening to it, I was like, this is like th – this hits all the <laughs> buttons for me. Like th that scratches that itch in my brain of the anthropology side and the food side and everything else. So uh, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about um, Anthro Dish and the communication work that you do. Well, hey there. Welcome to the mid-roll. How's it going so far? Are you enjoying the episode? Do you love Sarah as much as I did? Yeah, wonderful. Uh, tell your houseplants I said hi, by the way. I, I, I know they miss me when we're not together. Thanks so much to the Texas Tech Department of Plant and Soil Science for letting me do the show and for supporting it and for not firing me for doing that. I really appreciate it. But most of all, thanks to you, the listener. I do this for you. And I love to hear from you. So if you have feedback, if you have comments, you can leave those for me in a lot of different ways. First, hit me up on social media. I am Planthropology all the places. I am The Plant Prof all the places. I'm working on getting more of these up on YouTube. I know, I know. I've been talking about it for months and it's hard, okay? Okay, it's hard. But if you want to follow along on any of your favorite podcast players, do that. If you want to follow on YouTube, you can do that as well. You can also email me at planthropologypod at gmail.com if you have any feedback, ideas for future guests, or anything in between. Also, if you are the review-leaving type, you could leave me a review. I don't know when you're listening to this episode, but my birthday is in about a month. And what I've really been wanting, and if, if you could hook me up with this, is a brand new five-star review. Um, I wear a size five star, like I said. So if you want to leave me one of those, I would appreciate it forever. You can do that on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Podchaser or about a dozen other places. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is still to tell a friend about Planthropology because word of mouth is still the best way to get podcasts around. But also you could head to planthropologypodcast.com and pick up some merch and find old episodes. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash planthropology. And for the price of a cup of coffee, you could buy me a cup of coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. And it's important to me. I, a friend of mine once said that I died years ago. And it's all the caffeine in my system keeping me animated. Yes, my friends, I am a caffeine zombie. And if you would like this caffeine zombie to keep making this podcast, I would appreciate your support. Go follow Sarah all the places. Her information is in the bio thing. What is that called? The show notes. All her information's in the show notes. She talks about it at the end. But go follow the Anthro Dish podcast. It's wonderful. Uh, what else? There's another thing. Oh, yeah, I wrote a book. It's called Plants to the Rescue. If you have kids, if you have eyes, um, I think that you would really enjoy this book. So go check out Plants to the Rescue, all the places. Go check out Dr. Sarah Dugnan and buckle yourself right up for the second half of this episode where we talk about communication, we talk about Anthro Dish, we talk about food equity, and so many other things. It's great. You'll love it. Stick around and let's do it. All right, we are back. So let's talk about your podcast, Anthro Dish, which is wonderful, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I have I, I was actually really excited to have a big backlog to listen to. It's it's fun when I find <laughs> a new show, uh, and sometimes there's like ten episodes. I'm like, well, but now I have to like wait. You know, like that's, yep. that's, that's terrible. <laughs> I, that, I've gotten so used to like, you know, Netflix dropping an entire season of something at once that my brain is like, what do you mean I have to wait two weeks? How do I do that? <laughs> like, so um, how did that start? You've been doing it for quite a while, right? Mm -hmm, since 2018. Wow. Which, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel that long, but when you say it, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so what was, what was the inspiration for that? I mean, I assume just a lot of what we've been talking about. 
Yeah, it was really, I, again, like there was, there's one particular class and I love telling the story because I, I was TAing for someone who was just not rubbing me the right way. <laughs> <laughs> We've all um, been there. This, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and just, it was very, um, I mean, anyone that has listened to my show knows that I'm very like hypercritical about, um, the idea of infusing like wellness as a be all and end all in food. Um, and so within this class that was happening quite a bit and to a group of students who are pretty young, like these are, these are people in their 19 to 25 age bracket can be pretty impressionable. And I was just getting so frustrated sitting there. Um, it was like Monday nights between seven and 10 PM, super oh. snowy, super dark, like just the worst. <laughs> That's brutal. Seven. To, yeah. My goodness. <laughs> So truly like the worst time slot for any sort of course. And I was seeing the students falling asleep or starting to become really worried that, you know, they had a lot of anxiety around um, what foods they were able to eat. And, you know, food or university students can be really food insecure. Oh, yeah. Um, so just watching all that happen and, and feeling like there weren't alternative voices for people to to listen to and to hear from. Um, I just kind of felt compelled to to start having you know, I was having these conversations with people again, like working at restaurants, um, seeing all these different people linking to food in different ways. Um, it just felt like it was an injustice to not share those conversations. So it really like it started, you know, me having conversations with friends at my kitchen table. Like you can hear the kitchen table creaking in yeah. early episodes, <laughs> um, which, yeah, I don't I don't listen to those ones as often. <laughs> but <laughs> um, and then it kind of grew. And, and I think um, I've always made it a virtual conversation similar to what you're doing. And hmm. it allows you to just connect to people across the world that you wouldn't otherwise. And, you know, it, it would be people that um, I had spoken with on the show would say, oh, you know, so-and-so does some really cool work um, out in BC. You should talk to them. Um, and so gradually, I'm sure similar to you, you start to build this connection mm -hmm. with other people and you build this community. And yeah, I've, I've never looked back. Like it's just been, it's been such a like fun joyful community to build and to, to be able to meet people through it, uh, like yourself as well. Yeah. It's super cool. Super cool. So like what, what kind of topics have you covered on the show? I know that you had a lot of episodes, <laughs> so I, I understand, but like what types of things do you try to focus on? Is it just, I have gotten to the point over the years, you know, I've done this since, um, I started in November of 2019. Nice which was such a weird time to start something new like this yeah. right before, like we left for spring break in March of 2020 and didn't come back, you know, yep. I was like, <laughs> see you in August maybe. Uh, <laughs> and at the time I was trying to finish my dissertation and didn't want to. <laughs> and so yep, like same. I started a podcast. Cause I'm a, so we did the same thing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I just, I'm a glutton for punishment or something, but, yeah. uh, but over time it's like, I, I think when I started, I had sort of a vision of, okay, these are the types of conversations we're going to have. And these are the types of, and then at some point I was like, anyone who will talk to me has so much cool stuff to bring. You know what I mean? So like, what types of things do you try to, to focus on? Or is it just kind of the, oh, this sounds interesting. Let's do it. Oh, it's a good question. I find I'm a little bit of both. Like I want to say it's, I'll talk to anyone, but I've gotten a bit more restrictive in recent years and I'll explain why. But for me, it's always been um, thinking about the idea of food as knowledge and not being restricted to like the ivory tower. So hmm. I absolutely have like researchers, academics um, come on and, and share their research because that's important to, you know, put that past a paywall and talk about it in a way that's not going to make people's eyes dry over. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also think it's really important to value different forms of food knowledge. So you know, I, I always say in the beginning, it's this show that explores like food identity and culture. And, um, I see food as a very open-ended subject. So I've had people on talking about, um, substance use, um, alcohol, water, CBD beverages, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's still food. That's still something that oh, you yeah. ingest. Yeah. Um, I think where I put restrictions, um, is around like food products. I've, I've definitely had people oh. in the past, um, and I find I struggle a bit more with those sorts of stories because it's some of them have interesting stories behind them, but quite often, um, I think I, I hit that, you know, middle or 20 to 30 something white woman wellness <laughs> <laughs> realm a little bit sometimes. And, uh, 
Yeah, there was, I mean, there was one conversation I had with um, a wellness product that the Kardashians ended up campaigning for. And oh. that was kind of the line for me of like, ah, I don't, I don't <laughs> feel comfortable. Fair enough. Yeah. With that. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can see that though, because I feel like the whole tone of your show uh, is very much making food accessible, making it equitable. And, and sometimes some of those things are just not, they're, they're just not, and they're not more than that. They're not, they're not intended to be. Uh, yeah. And, and I think that, yeah. And and I also really appreciate and think it's really cool that you protect your space. Well, I think that that's important because this is like your message that you're getting out, but you're also platforming, um, a lot of really, really fascinating conversations and perspectives and protecting that is important. And and so that's that's admirable, I think. Thanks. Yeah, it was it was not an easy choice. It was honestly, I think it was around the pandemic point where that that was kind of where I was getting, um, you know, um, pitches from people or from PR agents that were selling like peanut butter or honey or <laughs> certain things that were just pancakes um, that were really expensive and and thinking you know particularly to the fact that you know if I'm getting sent these boxes of pancakes or honey or whatever <laughs> and I can't actually afford them mm. why would I why would I be talking about them on the show and I think you know wellness is a really important part of looking at food and thinking about health in a way that's like culturally um, founded and culturally accessible. Um, but that type of wellness, as you said, it's, it's just not, it's not an accessible form of it and it can do a lot of damage, um, kind of not to go down that rabbit hole. No, 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 sure. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I do, I do find like those sorts of things. Um, it was an interesting time because it was, it was looking at, using different food products as medicine, which is really important in certain cultural spheres. Um, but it was also coming up against a time where there was a lot of people who were, um, you know, kind of skeptical around vaccines and around everything to do with COVID, which, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of be in a place of, uh, having these, having the ability to have like nuanced conversations around it, but not saying like, you should only use honey to cure your, you know, um, strep. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Right. No, and that's again, and that is a, that's a hard line to tread. And and kind of like you said, like I'll get pitches from people sometimes for an episode. And for one, you know, I'm just kind of sponsored by my university. I do this sort of as part of my job, and so I have to be yeah. careful about conflicts of interest and, and those kinds of things. But like, I also like want to make sure I'm putting good science out there that I'm putting yeah. like good, true, factual information. So sometimes I'll get a pitch, and I'm just like. Like this would be a cool guest and I just can't do it. I just can't do yep. it because it, there's, there's a line there that I, I don't, I don't know that I know what the hard line is in my brain, but it's like, I know it when I see it, if that makes sense. Like if your brain curdles a little yeah. bit. <laughs> like, yeah. oh. Or, you know, thinking yeah. about the people that listen, like I, the last thing I would want to do is cause harm. Right. And uh, I I think that that's, again, uh, as communicators, as scientists, as educators, like that's such an important distinction to make sometimes. And it's really it can be really challenging for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think it really does matter, like who tells the story, too. Right. And, Hmm. and, um, you know, there's definitely been I've had pitches from like spice companies before who were you know, pitching spices from around the world, but they were (laughs) very much (laughs) white owned company from the States. Um, and I think it, those sorts of power dynamics to me are kind of central to my show of looking at like, who's telling the story. Has that story been told, um, effectively or have people been able to access that? And I'm sure similar to you, like there's a lot of students that listen to my show and I, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of guide them off, um, a place of curiosity, but I think it's, it's also as educators, like still your responsibility to, to make sure that you're, you're sharing good science, good stories that are founded in like, I don't know, more grassroots yeah, <laughs> for no, lack of a better term. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally, totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, so a, a couple uh, that this, this kind of brings a couple of questions to my mind. Um, and and maybe this one is is specific. And if it's not something you really want to dive into, we don't have to. But like when you cook at home, like what kinds of things do you like to cook? 
<laughs> oh, that's a fun question to ask right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for context, I'm currently, I'm uh, seven months pregnant and I cannot stand cooking. Oh, so. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. When you're not seven months yeah. pregnant, when the, the yeah. idea of it is not terrible to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's still a funny question because I find, um, I guess that's like an undercurrent in my show that, um, I, I had a long struggle with food and my relationship with it, which I'm pretty open about. Um, I tend to, you know, at least once a season have someone come on that speaks to like disordered eating experiences Mm -hmm. just to get different, you know, different voices around that. Um, so for me, like I spent a lot of time thinking about food as fuel as an athlete, like what, what can I put into my body that has like the most optimal output. Mm -hmm. Um, and so learning how to cook was like a, something I didn't really do until I was in my twenties. Um, I was vegetarian for a long time. So I think like, you know, I always come back to like bowl based foods, like what sort of grain, (laughs) be it like rice or, or buckwheat or things like that. Um, and then like beans, vegetables, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where I, I tend to go to. Okay. I just, yeah. I, I don't know. No, it's just an interesting, like it's, it's an interesting thing because I think we all have, again, different relationships with food in the way, like I grew up, I grew up cooking with my mom. Um, so we, like, it was just me and her for a lot of my childhood. And so, uh, she has always cooked very intuitively and just mm-hmm. like, she's, um, so I'm, I'm first generation American. My, uh, family immigrated from, um, India in the seventies. And so like the, the kind of the suite of spices and things that we use growing up were so different than like, you know, anything else. And so like, I've always like just tried stuff and sometimes that yeah. turns out real well and sometimes <laughs> less so. And so like, I don't know, I'm always just curious when people are sort of in the food and in the, some of these conversations, just like how, how they, they process that and think through it. So I, I appreciate your you know transparency on that just because it's an interesting at least in my mind, an interesting kind of thing. Yeah. And I always love like that's something, um, it's interesting that you say that about growing up and and being able to cook with your mom, because, you know, when I talk to people on the show quite often, that's like a central experience is that you grew up watching your mom being able to cook something that's like specific to your family. Um, and I grew up with like shake and bacon meatloaf, so, (laughs) which was fine. And, and it, you know, it served the purpose of fed us. And, um, yeah, I always find it really interesting. I think I think my relationship with food has made me more curious to keep asking questions about it because it took me so much longer to get to that point of having a good relationship with it. Sure. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so again, you're what, maybe a hundred episodes in more than a hundred episodes in your show. I don't remember exactly. Less than you. Cause I was looking at how many episodes I think I'm, I'm putting at one twenty three. Okay. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I kind of around the same, same spot. I, uh, for a while I was like, I'm going to put out a ton of content. And then I quickly burned out and took a break. (laughs) Fair. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That was a wild amount in that amount of time. (laughs) It was, it was a lot. And so I have gone to every other week now, or is your show weekly, weekly ish? Yeah, it's, it's weekly, but seasonal. So I had similarly done the thing of like, I'm going to put one out every single week because that's what the, you know, YouTubers that podcast told me to do (laughs) (laughs) when I started out. Um, I like to kind of align it with like the school semester. Um, even though I'm not teaching or a student at this point, there's something about it that just feels right to me. (laughs) So usually, yeah, seasons start in September and then I'm kind of in the process of wrapping up and having episodes wrapped by like end of April, early May. Okay. No, that's really cool. Yeah. I, I should think about my problem is I, I've tried to do that. Like last June, I was like, I'm going to take the summer off. And I took the rest of the year off. I was like, oh, that was maybe <laughs> a little bit like a little bit much. And so I have to, it, I have to at least keep some consistency or I find other things to fill that like block mm-hmm. of time with. And yeah. then my brain is just like, no, but we're already doing the other thing. <laughs> it's hard. I find it. I think I did a similar thing. Well, I, I ended up transitioning out of academia, but I was still like I was teaching and consulting at the same time. And so I similarly, I took a break and then I, it ended up being a year, um, which was like the longest amount of time away from podcasting. And there's something about like if you haven't done an interview for a while, I find 
I just get so much more nervous to just get that momentum going yeah. again. <laughs> oh, I t- oh, my first interview this year, uh, as I was getting back. In- so I did a solo episode jumping back into the into it and it was okay. And then I did an interview and I was like, I don't remember how to talk to people. Like, I know I've yeah. talked to people in the last six <laughs> months, but apparently I don't know how to do that right now. Yep. <laughs> it is it is such a like a skill and like a muscle you have to like train over time. Um, I agree. Yeah. Do you have it I, I like to ask this question to other podcasters, especially that interview people. Do you have like a couple of things that are like the your favorite things you've learned over the um process of doing this podcast? Yeah, there's so much. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay, I will say um one of the most interesting lessons I've ever gotten on the show was with, um, his name's Andrew Levin and he was talking about seafood fraud. And I had Hmm. no idea about that concept prior to interviewing him. Um, we had met through like some sort of podcast or Facebook group back in the day. And, um, so he was talking about how there's this huge problem, particularly in the U S and Canada where, um, seafood is mislabeled. So you're getting like a really cheap white fish, but it's labeled as like an expensive fish. Um, and the regulations around it, like he, he dove into that pun intended, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) and I had no idea before that. And so those are the sorts of lessons where, you know, um, that one or another one was, um, a friend of mine works as like a, um, she watches out for wildfires in Alberta, Hmm. um, during wildfire season. So she was talking about, you know, what sorts of foods that you eat, um, being a lookout at the fire tower and, you know, otherwise I'd I'd never hear those sorts of stories. So those are the ones that tend to stick. That's so cool. I've, I've found some like social media videos, TikTok and Instagram of, of like fire lookout people and like, you know, sitting up in the little, I don't know, I don't know, cabin on top of a mountain, like by themselves. And there's days that I'm like, that's the show. Like, that's the dream. Yeah. Like, I want to go <laughs> and be alone for, I, I know I would get bored. I'm too much of an extrovert. Like I, I have to, but but for like a week or two, that sounds just amazing. Yeah. That also spoken like a true academic though. <laughs> <laughs> Having that ability to like have the two weeks off and, and commit to like all the side projects we're thinking about too. <laughs> or, or, or literally just stare in the space for t- like, yeah. there's days that I'm like, I just want to like unplug my brain and just sit mm-hmm. here and stay like, I kind of ended up doing that last week during spring break. And I, <laughs> I, I find that I, I am not feeling guilty about it. And I, part of me, my academic brain feels like I should feel guilty about it. And I just don't. So yeah, maybe that's freedom. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's necessary. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, just in terms of like expanding Anthrodish more into food writing the last year or so. Mm-hmm. I find I get so much more, um, like if I see a headline relating to food, I'm immediately thinking about like how to write about it and how to think about it and, um, you know, how to bring anthropology into it. And it's so exhausting. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> you know, to just feel like you always have to have something to say about what's going on in the world. And so I think those, those breaks are very, very needed. Yeah. So speaking of always having to be on, you've, you've gotten into doing like social, you do social media too. Like, (laughs) uh, and I feel like as communicators, as science communicators, as, as, um, educators, like we almost have to these days, like we go Mm -hmm. where the people are and the people are on social media. Um, what has that experience been like for you? Is that something newer or have you been doing like the social media side of it the whole time you've been doing the podcast? Um, I've been doing like in terms of Instagram specifically, that's something where I did like I worked um, doing social media production for um, for different like field schools that I oh, worked okay. for. Um, and like I was always on Instagram in my 20s. So I was like, I might as well just, yeah. <laughs> you know, make it useful. I think where it's been more interesting for me is like going into TikTok and finally conceding that the algorithm is more enjoyable there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and more addictive, uh-huh. I guess. <laughs> that is the truth. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that was something that um, I had kind of started to play around with it. And then I ended up like doing a food assignment for students last year where um, traditionally they had to compare a dish at a restaurant with a dish that they made at home in terms of like how it was prepared and the nutritional ingredients and the cultural story behind it. And I changed that so that it was looking at like TikTok food trends, um, 
which led me to end up being on TikTok more because I was looking at these food trends like cacio pepe or um, what was it that like Greek that TikTok fed a pasta thing a few oh, years yeah. back that was really big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up realizing like, like I think for me through teaching and through just working within communities, like you, as you said, you have to go where people are and making TikTok a place where people can think about, you know, well, who's telling the story behind this cultural dish and is it actually telling like the full story of it or is it, you know, kind of flattening it for, a a very general audience hmm. and how can we kind of dig into that a bit more anthropologically um yeah i always say i entered as an anthropologist into tiktok but i feel like that's not the case anymore <laughs> <laughs> but it is such a cool like study into the way we again we talked about going back to something we talked about at the beginning of the episode how food is central to so many of our cultural experiences um and and in different cultures it's related in different ways and and having it out there for everyone to see across cultures. I think there's a lot of positives in that. And I think there's a lot of like scary parts of that too. Like, especially yeah. if you're the one like putting those things out there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I think for me, it comes back to the idea of like digital literacy within, you know, within teaching or within podcasting and, and social media use too is, and and I think that's something you do a fabulous job at oh, well, on TikTok um, <laughs> of just being able to kind of stop people from scrolling for a second and start to think about like, you know, who's the source that I'm I'm listening to? Why are they an expert? What do they have to offer? What sort of information am I getting from it? Um, you know, I, um, I'm trying to think of like a recent example, but there's, there's quite often so many things just kind of being thrown at you constantly. Oh, I think it was like cold plunges. Oh, I was yeah. doing some research on that <laughs> and the TikTok rabbit hole was, was vastly different from what, you know, um, scientists and educators were saying as well. So having that ability to, to be digitally literate, I think is an invaluable skill going forward. Absolutely. That's really interesting. Really interesting. Well, Sarah, as we, as we kind of wrap up here a little bit, it's, it's always, I don't know, it's always shocking to me how quickly some of these conversations go so <laughs> when they're, I mean, we're already 50 minutes in and it, it goes quick. Um, yeah. So a, cu- a couple of questions to wrap up. So where, where do you see yourself headed in terms of, you know, your career, your podcast, whatever else you want to do? Like what's, what's next for you? Oh, not to <laughs> I feel like anything I say I have to live up to. Oh, no, just or, yeah. or where do you think? Because I think that that also, in you know, life changes and life's complicated and, and all of that. So, no, I'm not trying to marry you to anything that you say. I'm just curious <laughs> no, like, what your thoughts for the future are. Um, I think for me, like Anthrodish is a, a thing. Again, like I started it when I was in my early 20s, mid mid 20s. Um, and <laughs> it's kind of started to gradually expand. Like I, I found being able to interview people was so fascinating, but I also, I, I was kind of like losing my own voice within it. Um, so for me, I'm really interested in building my writing up through it. Um, that's something that's been like a big goal of mine this past year is just kind of getting back into getting into public science writing, um, you know, finding the places that will house the stories that I want to tell, which, you know, I think we're, we kind of understand like that nexus of food and health and environment um, as being so, you know, you can't really untangle them. Um, But I think finding, finding a space for that publicly is like where I want to bring Anthrodish. So I still have the interviews. I still get to be able to share these fantastic conversations, but I also get to explore like the food anthro part a bit more practically within my writing too. Super cool. No, I love that. I love that. And I've, I've tried to dip my toes into writing recently as well and <laughs> non-academic writing, I should say, because that's yeah. Yeah, same. just like getting punched <laughs> in the face a bunch. It's so like, I, I know, I, I, cool. I, I think I'm, I'm risking something saying this openly at a, I, I am not that is not me. Like that is just not my thing. Like my, me neither. Publishing yeah. articles. Oh, I, oh, I, uh, Reviewer number two. I, oh, I just cannot, like I can do it and, and I'm not like bad at it. I just don't want to. So like, I'm all, I'm always looking into different ways to do things that are meaningful, that are still like scholarship, but maybe not in yeah. the, uh, I'm going to sit here and send in an article and then cry about the reviews for a while. And then, you know, yeah. 
Well, especially, you know, I think about the review process in journals and like, I'm, I'm happy to have done that and to experience it, but it takes so long. And I remember, you know, back in the early days of my PhD, I wanted to find some work on like food in Instagram. And that was, I want to say 2015, and it's only just coming out now. Whereas you have, and not to like dump on academia, I I still really much value it, but I think, I think it's really important, especially when we're in a place where there's just so much misinformation and there's, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of harm that can come to that, to our communities. It's really important to, to continue having, you know, public outreach as I, I, again, I see it as like a responsibility of, of academics and educators to, to maintain that when you have so much knowledge, you know, it's, it's up to you to like be able to continue sharing it with others. Yeah. Love that. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I want to ask you is is a question I ask all my guests. Uh, if you had something you wanted to leave people with, like a piece of advice, uh, what it could be about uh, liter- honestly anything, um, what would that be? Like what, what do you wish that people listening to this episode knew? Oh, that's a good question. I think for me the big one that I always want to hit home about is that um, – food as much as it's uh something that can bring people together to get them to talk about bigger issues it's also um it's also a tool that can be used against community Hmm. to break community and i think for me having that ability to balance both lenses of looking at food as a tool both for good or for bad for you know to kind of generalize it for me that's the big message is kind of thinking about like how is food being used um be it in your grocery store or at your family dinner table or Um, within your communities at large, is it being used to bring people together or are there people that are using tactics to kind of fracture, fracture community and and thinking about food as that kind of stepping stone to look at those bigger issues as well. It's fascinating. Yeah. I think that's such a good thing to keep in mind and remember for sure. Uh, Sarah, uh, again, 50 plus minutes has gone quick and I've, I've gen- yeah. genuinely a pleasure. I've so much enjoyed talking to you and hearing from your experience and just, uh, what you do. I, I think it's, uh, again, very inspiring and, and very good and necessary work. So thanks for doing it. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And likewise, it's honestly, it's such a pleasure to be able to connect with someone that does this in, in their own way through plant anthropology as well. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, where can people find yeah. you, uh, plug your stuff. Considering I ask that to everyone, you'd think I'd be prepared. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So anthrodish.com is my website. Um, You can find me on any podcast platforms um, at anthrodish podcast, uh, across social media at anthrodish podcast. And then my newsletter is saradugnan.substack.com. Awesome. And I'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes. But thanks again. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, or I guess it's only Monday uh, as we record this. So I hope you have a wonderful week and uh, uh, just thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks, Vikram. Y'all go follow Sarah all the places. Is she not the best? Again, I said it earlier, but she's the best. Also, the Anthrodish podcast is fantastic. So go listen to that too. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and all the episodes of Planthropology. You know I do this for you and I appreciate you so much. Thanks to the Texas Tech Department of Plant and Soil Science for supporting the show. Thanks to the award-winning composer, Nick Scout, for our music, If You Want to Love Me, Babe which is just so jangly and fun. I love folk music, and he did such a good job on it. And once more, go follow Sarah all the places. Y'all spend some time thinking about the role that food serves in your life and in your community and how you can make that more equitable and better. Keep being kind to one another. If you have not to this time been kind to one another, maybe give that a shot. It's pretty cool. Keep being very cool plant people. You know I love you, and I will talk to you very soon.